Hey, thanks uh, for introducing me. I'm uh, Mariano. This is a joint work between Eurecom, Symantec Research Labs, and University of uh, Milan. And uh, today in this research, I'm going to talk uh, mainly about the analysis of uh, sandbox uh, datasets. So let's start. In the past decade, uh, many uh, security researchers have um, collected and then analyzed uh, a large number of uh, malware samples. This, um, a large number of malware samples. This number is in the order of tens, even uh, hundreds of millions of unique malware samples. Um, Researchers generally, I mean, I have published many papers, uh, reports, and statistics um, by using this uh, data set. But then uh, we all know that um, the vast majority of uh, these samples is not really interesting because, for example, they contain many polymorphic variations of the same um, known uh, samples. So in this talk, we're going to um, have a look at one of these sandbox data sets. In particular, we will inspect the Anubis sandbox data set. Anubis uh, is uh, one of the first online uh, um, sandbox that was available online. And um, um, what we notice is generally that, OK, if uh, you uh, look closer at this uh, data set, you can find uh, some uh, really interesting cases. For instance, um, some uh, of the f most of the famous uh, samples used, for example, in APT campaigns have been submitted sometimes in a really weird uh, um, situation from, the, from some, uh, for example, from some uh, DSL residential networks and uh, have been submitted months and even years before they were um, detected by antivirus companies and APT campaigns has been publicly disclosed. For instance, one of the samples of the APT1 campaigns has been submitted 43 months in advance to our sandbox before the Mandiant report. Second, we, uh, uh, second, uh, we also notice a continuous interaction between uh, um, the malware authors and our sandbox. Then we, so we decided to manually look uh, at some of these interesting cases. And what we discovered is that uh, most of the cases, the malware authors um, are just developing new evasion techniques. And uh, in other cases, they are just testing some, um, for example, suspicious programs. Additionally, additionally, we also talked with some other sandbox maintainers. And they confirmed that they observed more or less the same behaviors on their sandbox data sets. So starting from these observations, we, we wondered if it's possible to design a system that is able to automatically detect these malware developments uh, inside the sandbox data sets. So we devised uh, the following systems that is composed by many um, components. The first one is the filtering part. In the filtering part, we filter out all the irrelevant samples. Then we cluster the interesting samples uh, via binary similarity. Then once that we have these clusters, we inspect uh, um, samples by samples with some fine-grade binary, anal bi binary analysis techniques. Then uh, by using, um, we extract uh, many features coming from, for example, the static analysis, the dynamic analysis, the submission metadata, and also uh, from some external feeds like uh, virus totals. So, and then uh, we collect all these features. And then we train a classifier, and, and thus we run some machine learning algorithm. So now in the following slides, now I'm going to introduce every component in details. So our initial data set is composed by over 30 million of samples. So uh, before starting, so before performing any analysis, we want to reduce uh, the amount of information that we need to process, OK? Um, for, this, uh, for this reason, we decided to filter out all the samples that are not strictly related to malware development. To start with, we filter out all the samples that have, uh, that have been submitted uh, from uh, batch submissions coming from, uh, for example, uh, from um, security companies uh, uh, and research centers. So in this way, we, we, uh, man we take only the submission coming from individual users. 
Then we decide to, to remove all the samples that even if they have been submitted to, even if they have been submitted uh, by an individual users, they are not, uh, um, they, they have been observed bef uh, before uh, in our sandbox. For example, the submission was uh, coming from a big submitter like uh, a research center. Then we decide to uh, filter out all the samples that even if they have been submitted by individual users and they have been observed for the first time in our sandbox dataset, they have been uh, observed, for example, before by virus totals and, for example, also by an antivirus uh, company, in our case, uh, Symantec. So at the end, we have more than uh, 214,000 uh, unique malware samples. And this is uh, our, let's say, final data set uh, of the reasonable candidates. The reasonable candidates for malware development because they have been submitted by individual users, they have never been observed in the wild, and they are unknown uh, from security and antivirus companies. But in order to simplify our job, uh, we decide to filter out, uh, I mean, uh, also the packet binary. We decided to do this because uh, we, since we needed then to apply some static analysis techniques, and then more importantly, we want to double check our results. So, so the, we take the decision to filter out the packet binary. But I will uh, come, uh, get back to this point uh, later in my presentation. Then the second step uh, is the clustering part. The main goal of the clustering is uh, to group together all the samples that, that I mean, uh, are related to possible malware development. For this goal, we use an agglomerate review clustering that is uh, mainly based on uh, the binary similarity part and some submission metadata. For the binary similarity part, we use a tool like SSDeep that is implementing uh, some uh, fade hashing techniques. And for the submission metadata, uh, we mainly rely on the submission, uh, this, uh, the submission uh, time because we want to extract, for example, the timeline, the submission timeline. Then we want to reduce the number of comparisons because we have many samples. And for this reason, we decide to have a sliding window of seven days. Then in order to ensure the binary similarity, we decide to took a similarity threshold for the fuzzy hashing algorithm of 70%. This threshold has been proven by previous research to be the optimal threshold in order to minimize the number of false positives. So after running the, um, the clustering, we obtain almost 6,000 clusters containing on average 4.5 elements each. Then the, the next step is the fine-grain binary, uh, binary analysis. So let's imagine that we have the clusters uh, depicted on the, on the left of the slide. And uh, this uh, cluster is composed of um, four nodes, every node, of, of course, uh, every node represents a sample, the, and ev every edge represents the similarity. Then, first of all, we first uh, normalize the assembly code of each sample. Uh, we just uh, normalize uh, um, the operands in this case. Then we extract the timeline of this, uh, for the submission time, and, we, uh, and sample by sample, we compare um, we, uh, we compare the samples using uh, binary diffing techniques. And first, we start uh, by inspecting the call graph. If we find there a mismatch, then we literally zoom, and we have a look at the control flow graph. So we had a look at the basic block level. Then we extract uh, the, the, there is the step for the feature extraction that is composed of uh, two phases. The first one, we, first we extract the um, First we, first, we extract the features for the samples. And then we, once that we have the samples, we, tie, we try to aggregate these features, and we extract the features for a single cluster. So the samples features, um, they are grouped by uh, six categories containing for, for a total of uh, 25 uh, um, features. We have like, uh, categories like the file features, then the timestamps, where the timestamp is really important, for example, when uh, during an investigation, to extract some uh, intelligence like the submission timeline. Then we have the antivirus uh, features coming from external feeds like uh, virus total. Then we have the user-based features because uh, um, Anubis allows the user 
to submit the samples from a web interface. So we can then start the main information like the user agent or the IP address of the submitter. Then we use the binaries feature set uh, coming from the static analysis set, uh, phase that I previously described. And then we have the behavioral features that are coming from the dynamic analysis. So they are coming from the report generated by our sandbox. Instead for the clustering features, uh, we try to aggregate uh, all the features uh, of the samples and then to create some interesting features that are just for the cluster. Some of these interesting features are, for example, uh, the shape of the cluster that uh, is really interesting. And in this way, for example, we can um, extract some interesting patterns and in this way extract some interesting uh, clusters that are possible, for example, for development. Then another, inter then another interesting feature that um, coming from the cluster features is that, for example, we can have a pattern like um, we can extract, for example, all the clusters that in which the first samples, for example, are completely unknown to any antivirus uh, companies, and, uh, but the last one is uh, known and is uh, uh, labeled as malicious. And this is, of course, a good indicator for a cluster that is a possible development or at least is worth having a look. Then another, in, also another interesting feature here, another possible partner, is uh, um, the possibility to, for example, to extract all the clusters in which the first samples have a, real co uh, a really complex behavior and that you can serve, for example, on the um, analysis report. But uh, the last samples of the cluster has no behavior at all because probably is implementing uh, a anti an anti-sandbox check, so after a few seconds is quitting the execution. Then uh, the last step, or once that we have extract all these uh, features, we have uh, the machine learning component. We test many uh, machine learning algorithms, but we had the best results with the logistic model tree. The logistic model tree is a combination of the decision tree plus the log logistic regression. In this way, we can build a decision tree in which the leaves uh, have a linear uh, regression model. But here, the, main, the logistic model tree is a supervised uh, algorithm. So we need our ground truth, we need our training set, and uh, this is the real challenge for us. We need to label um, our manually our, our data set. So we, we randomly uh, choose uh, 200 clusters, and um, at the end of the manual analysis, we were able to flag uh, 91 clusters as a non-development and 66 clusters as a development. The remaining clusters, um, we were not 100% sure, sure because in some cases it's really difficult to decide when is development and when is not, even for uh, uh, an expert or reverse engineer. Because if you imagine, for example, when you have a small cluster, for example, of uh, two samples, um, when you have a small cluster of two samples, and you start uh, doing uh, some uh, binary diffing techniques, it's really difficult when you have, uh, for example, just two different functions to understand if it's a development or if it's just a, a, a simple variation. So once that we run our, um, then we run our classifier on the whole data set, and this is our results. We had more, uh, we had more than 3,000 uh, clusters as a potential development. And, the 50, and uh, roughly the 50% of these uh, clusters uh, were considered malicious. So this means that at least one sample is, is uh, known by antivirus companies there. Then these malicious clusters is detected uh, on average uh, in the wild by antivirus company after more than um, 100 days. And generally these uh, malwares has been detected um, all over the world on more than uh, thousands of computers. And let's say that the malware nature of um, these samples is ranging from all the kind of uh, malware uh, families like Trojans, uh, backdoors, and even keyloggers. Then now I will um, present some uh, interesting examples that we were able to find manual uh, through our algorithm. The first one is about the development of an anti-sandbox technique. So if uh, we have a look at the timeline, 
Here we can, uh, we can see, okay, first of all, our cluster is composed of uh, three samples. If uh, then we have a look at the um, submission time and compile time, we see an interesting pattern that actually the, um, the, 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 the malware author is uh, actively developing something, so he's compiling and then immediately is um, submitting uh, his creation on, uh, to our sandbox. In fact, you can see a small difference uh, between the compile time and the submission time in the order of a few minutes. Then, more interestingly, the first uh, two samples were completely unknown to any antivirus company, while the last one was uh, considered as uh, malicious. Then, if uh, we start having a look at the binary, the first sample is just implement in, in the main function is just calling, for example, an API just to list all the processes uh, uh, in a Windows system. But then, starting from the second samples, we have an additional um, block here in the code that is actually implementing an anti-sandbox uh, 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 feature. As you can see here, is, uh, the author is first calling the, the times the timestamp counter register that is uh, containing the, uh, the CPU cycles. Then is invoking uh, an API in this case the close handle, and then is calling again the timestamp. In this way, uh, given the fact that the, this uh, particular API is hooked by the sandbox, it can detect a time discrepancy and uh, uh, it can uh, detect the sandbox environment. Then the, sec the, the last samples is uh, the difference between the second and the third samples is just on the tuning the threshold for the time discrepancy. And it's interesting because only the, the last one is detected as uh, malicious. Then another interesting case is about the Trojan dropper, uh, Troj uh, Trojan dropper development. In this case, we have uh, a cluster that is composed of uh, five um, executables. Uh, the first four clusters, uh, the first four um, samples um, have a compile time that is not uh, really consistent um, with the submission time. But uh, if we have a look at the submission time, it's uh, really interesting. All the samples are submitted with a difference of a few hours. Then another interesting fact here is that the first four samples are written in Delphi, and the last one is written in Visual Basic. And actually, this is really weird, because during development, generally, um, a developer is always using the same language. Then uh, if uh, we look at the binaries of the first four samples, they are almost the same. The only difference is about a few uh, instructions just dealing with some thread uh, synchronization code. Then, uh, if, we, if we have a look at the Visual Basic, uh, if, uh, at the Visual Basic one, it's the only sample that is known by, an antivirus company, by antivirus companies and is detected as a Trojan dropper. Then, if we look at the similarity between the last Delphi samples and the uh, Visual Basic uh, one, we can see a similarity of the 100%. So this means that then if uh, we manually look at the samples, the Delphi samples elite is uh, literally embedded inside the uh, Visual Basic one. And then once it is uh, executed, the Visual Basic one is dropping the, Del the Delphi executable that then uh, turns uh, into a code injection on a remote process. More interestingly here is that the, there are uh, two IP addresses involved, uh, one for the submission of the first uh, Delphi uh, executables <coughs> and one for the Visual Basic ones. And then if uh, we have a look at the last uh, IP address, we, uh, at the last executable, what we notice from the um, report or generated by the sandbox is that the um, the samples is using some uh, dynamic DNS service, in our case, no IP. And uh, if uh, we have a look at the IP that is resolved by the DNS request, is the same one of the submitter, okay? So then we, this is a, a really interesting behavior, so we decide to uh, have a look at this connection back uh, behavior in, uh, the wo in our world dataset, and we discover that, that uh, in general, almost 2,000 clusters share the same uh, connection back behavior. And this is a clear indicator of uh, 
some development or at least some testing. Then, uh, okay, clearly our system is, uh, is not perfect. So now let's get back at the packed binaries. Some of the, propo uh, some of the proposed features uh, can work also uh, for the packed binaries. Unfortunately, some others, uh, not at all, like for example, the static analysis ones. In, in addition, some um, core components like the clusterings need uh, to be adapted um, in order to work uh, with the packed binaries. Second, our system, okay, of course, can be, can be eva uh, easily evaded. This is true, but uh, the malware author has uh, to interact uh, with our system if uh, he wants to know and learn the internal mechanism of our sandbox. So in the worst case, we can just observe the, um, the development of uh, a single ev evasion technique, but then uh, by developing some uh, more advanced uh, methodologies, we can link these, uh, the development of these evasion techniques to the first malware family that is actually implementing this, bypassing, uh, this, this new bypassing method. Then, uh, to con in, uh, in conclusion, we believe that uh, there is a valuable information inside, um, hidden inside uh, the, um, the sandbox uh, dataset. And uh, in this paper, we just collected the, let's say, the low-hanging low fruits, but these low-hanging fruits were more than enough uh, to detect some really interesting cases. We hope that in the future, some other researchers will work on the same direction and will propose more advanced uh, systems in order to detect even uh, advanced and complex uh, samples. And hopefully, they, will, able, they will, be, will be able to design a system that is um, able actually to uh, detect some APT samples uh, months and even years uh, before they are publicly disclosed. That's all, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so I have one. Done. Uh, once the attackers you know you are doing that, I mean, what kind of change they will adapt? For example, they will not submit to animals, they will or submit few samples, or they will try to do, uh, evade your features. Can you comment on that? Okay, uh, so I just, okay. The, if the attacker is uh, submitting, uh, it <coughs> depends on what uh, actually the attacker is developing. So if the attacker is just developing an evasion techniques, he has to, the, to interact more than one time with our system. If the attacker instead is developing, is developing um, a real malware, he can interact only a only, only few times, let's say one, one time, and if it's lucky enough and uh, skilled enough, his creation can work uh, as, a, as a, the first time. So let's say that for the probes, so for the, all the programs that interact with our sandbox, uh, it's easier for us, I mean, to uh, detect these, uh, these creations, but for the malware development, if the attacker is motivated and smart enough, is, there is no reason to submit the entire malware. There is just the reason for the one, uh, just for the evasion techniques. That's it. This is really interesting stuff. So. Um when talking to somebody from the security industry, um, he told me that the way he would define APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, is when it looks like uh, the software development team for the malware included a project manager. All right. So, um, hmm. you know, can, can you uh, can you say something about the software development practices uh, of the more sort of uh, vanilla type of malware versus the, the ones that are more like the equation example that you gave. Yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, we uh, just collect uh, all the known and available reports about the APT campaigns, and then we just uh, have a look about if the hash was uh, present in our data set. And then uh, of the development that we have found in our papers are not related to the um, APT cases. 
there are two unrelated stuff. So uh, the, let's say the first interesting fact is that there are some uh, APT samples inside the data set. But we don't have the development, or at least we were not able to detect it. Then the other interesting stuff is that there is an actual development, especially for uh, the evasion techniques. So about the, let's say, software development for APT, we don't uh, have any information. We just know that we have these samples there. And we detect, uh, and, and we know that we have these samples there when it's too late. Like, uh, as we can see in, in the first slide, we have these, uh, uh, Yeah, as you can see here, I mean, we detect when, when it's uh, actually really too late. Because, for example, for the APT1, it's uh, 43 months. That is uh, more than, I think, three years. But we don't have the development. That's it.